Some early viewers of this channel may remember our first ever series created by Ben called Fossil Friday, where he did a breakdown of different fossils each week. The series ended in 2017 when we moved on to bigger and better videos on the channel, but now under my stewardship, Fossil Friday 2.0, if you will, is going to take on a slightly different focus. Ben focused mainly upon new fossils being found and their scientific significance. However, as you may know, me, Ollie, Ben's brother and Animal the Week guy, and Doug are actually studying history at university, and Ben is the only one actually doing paleontology. So my Fossil Fridays are going to take a look into the fascinating and rich history of paleontology, studying the methods, rivalries, politics, economics, and scientific breakthroughs behind some of the biggest and most famous paleontological discoveries in history, and how they have continued to shape the history of science to this day. For this episode, I've chosen a fossil near and dear to my heart, and I'm sure a lot of people's hearts all over the world, Dippy the Diplodocus. The significance of Dippy to science and popular culture makes her a worthy subject for the first episode of this series revival. Our story starts in 1877 with the infamous Bone Wars between Yale paleontologist Othniel Charles Marsh and Philadelphia paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope. The Bone Wars as a historical event is worth its own video, so I'll keep it to just the parts relevant to our Diplodocus. Diplodocus longus, the type species of Diplodocus, was discovered by two paleontologists hired by Marsh to dig at the Garden Park site in Colorado, Benjamin Mudge and Samuel Williston. What they found was not Dippy, but it was the first Diplodocus fossil, though it was very incomplete. They only found two caudal vertebrae and a chevron, and various other fragmented materials. It was sent back to Yale, and a year later in 1878, Marsh completed his description and called it Diplodocus longus. But it was not the idea of Diplodocus that captured the world's attention. Rather, it was a similarly huge and much more publicised discovery of a Brontosaurus by famed fossil digger William Harlow Reed in 1898. Brontosaurus had already been discovered in 1879 by Reed, but this discovery was bigger and far more publicised. And so the idea of an enormous behemoth-like lizard walking across the surface of the earth began to capture the imaginations of the American people people and the wider world, and most importantly, the imagination of Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie was a Scottish-American steel magnate who had revolutionised the American steel industry by seeking to own the entire production process from mine to kiln to mill in order to increase efficiency and keep costs down. Whether you think this was amazing industrial and technological progression or predatory monopolization, one thing's for certain, it made him rich. At the end of his life, he made a monumental decision to start giving away his money. He had the intention to use his wealth to become a philanthropist and funded various libraries and schools, hospitals, but most relevant to us, the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in 1895, located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where his industry had been based. But with this brand new museum, Carnegie was seeking a centerpiece, and it was actually Brontosaurus, not Diplodocus, that he set his eye upon. This was curio cabinets on a whole new level of wealth and and splendor. Being a steel magnate meant that Carnegie wasn't exactly an expert on dinosaurs, so needed someone to run this museum and seek new acquisitions. After a bit of a failed start and a resignation, that job eventually went to William Jacob Holland, a personal friend of Carnegie's and the Chancellor of the Western University of Pennsylvania, currently the University of Pittsburgh. Holland was not a paleontologist by trade, he had attended Princeton Theological Seminary and had become a priest, but he did a lot of other things. He taught ancient languages at Pennsylvania College for women, and became a renowned lepidopterist through amateur passions. It wasn't until 1891 and his post as Chancellor of Pitt University that he began to teach anything close to paleontology, when he used his expertise as a naturalist on the United States Eclipse Expedition to Japan in 1887 to teach anatomy and zoology. His interest in natural sciences was very much homegrown. His lack of paleontological knowledge did not concern Carnegie though, as he was seeking someone who knew how to organise and run large institutions rather than a scientific genius. Holland joined the team in 1898, but kept his position as Chancellor of Pittsburgh University until 1901 when he gave up that job in order to focus solely upon Carnegie's vision. It didn't take long for Holland to get straight to work. One of Holland's first moves was to seek out the services of the best fossil diggers in the West. William Harlow Reed and his 1898 Brontosaurus was Holland's first target. Holland decided to travel west all the way to Wyoming in an attempt to poach Reed from the University of Wyoming and buy the Brontosaurus he had discovered 
and that had been so widely publicised. This was easier said than done, especially because of the fact that the skeleton of Brontosaurus didn't exist. The hype of newspapers like William Randolph Hearst's New York Journal that proclaimed the most colossal animal on Earth had been found turned out to be just journalistic embellishments, and all that Reed had actually found was a fragment of a large thigh bone. Nonetheless, Reed was still one of the most experienced fossil hunters in the world, having been digging since 1877 when he was first employed by Othniel Charles Marsh, and so Holland still hired him to dig for Carnegie. The next acquisitions were both from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Arthur Cogshall and Jacob L. Wartman. Cogshall was known as one of the best preparators in America at the time, and Wartman a great paleontologist and now the new curator of the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. Both soon made the arduous journey west to Wyoming to help Reed find more of his behemoth. Sadly, nothing more was found, and it seemed Holland and Carnegie's hope of an enormous centerpiece for their museum had been dashed. Despite the setback, Wartman, Reed, Cogshall, and Reed's young son, who had joined the dig, did not give up the hunt. They left the Freeze Out Hills, where the Brontosaurus had been originally discovered, and set up a dig in Sheep Creek in the Morrison Formation. Here they finally had some success. On July 4th, coincidentally, they reported to Holland that they had found something big. Wartman wrote, Very happy to report some good luck at last. We have two good prospects, on which we are now working. One was described as a small Brontosaurus, many vertebrae, pelvic, and limb bones. The bones are in fine preservation, and the prospect looks better every day. The other prospect was described as a very large brontosaurus. The prospects were so good that Holland immediately went west to join them. At that time, it was rather easy for Holland, as by 1899, the Union Pacific Railway had caught on to the fact that there was money and prestige to be collected through fossil hunting, and so offered free passage to Wyoming for any paleontologist going to dig. This was done in partnership with the University of Wyoming. The profit in this scheme being that though they could go there for free, they would have to pay a lot in shipping costs for any large discoveries made that would need to be taken east on the Union Pacific trains. As you can no doubt tell by the pictures that have been shown, a lot of paleontologists made use of this scheme, with teams from the American Museum of Natural History under Henry Fairfield Osborne coming to observe and even help in the dig at Sheep Creek. By the time Holland arrived, it had been realised that the small Brontosaurus was in fact a very well-preserved Diplodocus, and the large Brontosaurus was actually an Apatosaurus. But Holland had been notified of this before he arrived, and was so confident in the discoveries he had already talked to the press, saying, Of the nature of this discovery, it is not time now to speak at length, but it suffices to say that from the present prospects, it appears we shall become in all probability the possessors of one of the largest and possibly the most perfect skeleton hereto found of a colossal dinosaur belonging to the genus Diplodocus. And just like that, Carnegie and Holland forgot all about brontosauruses and instead saw Diplodocus as their new centrepiece. By September, the Diplodocus had been fully excavated. Sadly, no skull had turned up. All they could find was a small scrap of the lower back jaw. The Apatosaurus had also been fully excavated, and they were lucky enough to get a Stegosaurus as well. Now it was time for the Union Pacific to make their money. Or so they thought, because Holland managed to use his connections with Carnegie to get the fossils shipped for free the entire way back to Pittsburgh. And this was even after he had fallen ill with appendicitis in the middle of nowhere in Wyoming and had to rush back to Pittsburgh himself. The discovery the discovery of Diplodocus would, however, prove to be the ending of Reed and Wartman's employment by Holland. Wartman was either fired or resigned, sources are contradictory and unclear on this, in 1900. This was due to a dispute with Holland over the bones they had found. Wartman increasingly had thought of Holland as less intelligent and essentially Carnegie's bulldog more than a scientist, which is true to some extent. But this led to friction between the fiercely smart and proud Wartman and Holland. In one letter to a friend, he wrote, Their knowledge of the subject, however, is very crude at present, but they are willing to listen to wise suggestions, meaning his suggestions. This brooding conflict came to a head in February 1900, when Wartman published an article in Science magazine claiming that the bones they had found might not be Diplodocus, but actually Barosaurus, thereby discrediting the grand statement Holland had made in 1899 when he was travelling to see the discoveries. Wartman left the museum and went to Yale to work on the huge collection left over after Othniel Charles Marsh died in 1899. He certainly wanted this job, as he had a fascination with many of the large Cenozoic mammals in the collection, but whether he resigned before he was fired is unknown. 
Reed's time was up as well. Holland hired one John Bell Hatcher to take over Wartman's position. Hatcher was renowned in the paleontological world. He had worked for Marsh at Yale since 1884, discovering the holotype specimen of Triceratops and the first Taurosaurus. He was known as the King Collector. He left Yale in 1893 and worked for Princeton, going on three expeditions to Patagonia during his time at the university. Joining Holland's team in 1900 meant that he was to be Reed's supervisor. Reed was very much a free spirit outdoorsman. He had worked on the railroad before becoming employed by Marsh and didn't like a lot of supervision. Reed's issues came to a head when he kept promising bigger and bigger discoveries that didn't pan out. This led Hatcher to believe he needed more supervision under Olaf Peterson, a Swedish man who was the curator of mammalian paleontology at the Carnegie Institute. This infuriated Reed, who said he would quit if put under the supervision, stating, I will never strike a pick in the ground under Mr. Peterson. However, this backfired as Hatcher wanted an excuse to get rid of Reed after his prospects began drying up. Just before Reed's dismissal, Hatcher had begun assessing the Diplodocus fossil and found out they were actually missing a lot of Diplodocus. It was more than had ever been found before, but not enough to be a centerpiece mount as Carnegie and Holland had hoped. Luckily, Hatcher was in the field in 1900 and went back to Sheep Creek, discovering a second, slightly smaller Diplodocus that filled in many of the gaps in the first one. Now with the two skeletons found and dug out, it's the end of the dig and the end of part one of this two-part video series. In the next video, we'll be looking at the description, preparation, and casting of Dippy, then following our Diplodocus all over the world to learn about how it became so globally famous and loved. Thank you for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you'd like to learn more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it and if you'd like to see more from us.